Hey folks, in this video I'm going to show you how you can prep and salt your hides so you can send them directly to the tannery on your own. This goes for the case where you just want to do a hide that you're going to use for a throw in your house or if you want to actually salt and prep a cape. This is a skill set that I think every hunter should know how to do and there's a bunch of obvious reasons for this but there's also a couple that aren't so obvious. I've saved thousands of dollars by salting and prepping my own hide. That's the big obvious one. The second obvious one is it's just fun to know how to do it. It's just a good skill set and it has some practical implications. If you're doing remote hunts and you know how to salt hides and salt capes, it can save you from a lot of problems, right? If you're in the back country of Alaska where you just can't come out early if you've got an animal down in the first few days, if you're able to pack some salt in, you can get that cape or that hide to a place where it can store pretty much indefinitely. But the less obvious one that I think people way underrate, they're always worried about doing it right. So they want to rely on the taxidermist to do it for them because they think it takes the risk out of the process. Unfortunately, from my experience with dealing with hundreds of hunters and them dealing with their own taxidermist, going through a taxidermist is way more risky than just knowing how to do this on your own. When it comes to capes and hides, the real damage that results in slipping of the cape, and when I say slipping, I'm talking about hair falling out, and we'll get into that more uh, through the video. The real risk of that usually comes from improper storage and transportation. If you're taking a hide fresh off an animal, taking it to a taxidermist, and then he's storing it, then freezing it, then getting it out way months down the road with a bunch of other hides he's got to take care of, and then processing, processing it, and then sending it to the tannery, there's exposure to a lot of uncontrollable things during that process and even controllable stuff that just doesn't get taken care of, right? Like stuff gets set out too long, stuff gets shipped and it's exposed to the wrong type of temperatures. All of that is a major risk. But if you know how to do this process on your own, you take that out of it. The other big one that I've noticed a lot over the years is the time frame, right? The time frame of getting back a hide or getting back a cape. If you do this process on your own and go direct, I guarantee you that you're gonna get hides back in probably conservatively one third of the time that it's gonna take if you take them to a taxidermist, all right? The reality is most taxidermists, particularly on hides that you're just gonna use on a throw, they send those to big wholesale tanneries and you can do that same thing. You can send them direct. It's a simple process. You don't need a lot of tools. Do me a favor, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a ton, guys. The first thing I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna show you just a simple hide preparation with a whitetail hide, okay? This is just gonna be your typical throw, right? The, the hide has been cut below the head of the animal, you know, off at the knees, right at the hamstrings on the back. So it's just gonna be a nice throw, all right? And then here I've got an Oryx, and what I'm gonna show you on the Oryx is, I'm gonna actually show you how to prep a hide that's gonna be used for a cape, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to turn the lips, do the ears, do the eyes, all of that stuff. I'll show you how to do that on the Oryx so you know how to prep your own capes. All right, so first things first, whenever you're out harvesting the animal, doing your field work, gutting, skinning the animal, you've got to think about it a little bit and that's going to save you a lot of time on this part of the process. Check out my video where I skin an Oryx and prep the meat and the hide and all the taxidermy to get it home on an airline. Okay, you can check that video out right here. That'll be useful to you because I show you how to really clean skin an animal. And that means just be meticulous, keep all the tendons, flesh, you know, muscle meat, fat, keep that all on the animal and off of your hide. If you do that meticulously, there's not much of a fleshing process really before you salt them. You can really get away with just a little knife work, clean it up a little bit and then salt it. And you'll see that on these hides, these are both done well. But reference that video because there's some technique to the skinning process that's gonna save you a whole lot of time. If you're just messy and you leave a bunch of brisket meat on there and a bunch of other meat on the animal, you're gonna have to deal with that now. And what happens is once you get the hide off, it's a lot harder to work on. It's a lot harder to get that stuff off and you end up having to flesh the whole hide. And I, I will show you that process, but a lot of times you get away without doing that and it just, it'll save you a ton, amount, a ton of time because the fleshing process takes a little work. It's another skill set. And the other thing is it takes a lot of setup and cleanup in particular, right? You're gonna get stuff all over the ground. Now, 
The one thing I will say is if you're doing this with predators, particularly bears, bear hides, doesn't matter how clean you skin them, when you skin them, particularly in the fall, because of the grease and the fat on those animals, you're going to have to generally flesh them. There's just no way to get all that material off in the field, so be prepared for that. But these other game animals, just be really careful how you skin them and you're going to save a lot of time. The other thing is, when you get animals home, in your mind you're not thinking like, okay, I'm ready to clean up this hide, flesh it, salt it, and send it directly to the tanner. You don't have another day to do that. You're usually catching up on life stuff, right? So usually what people do is they're gonna freeze those capes or they're gonna freeze those hides. When you do that, and I mentioned this in other videos too, you wanna be conscientious of what work needs to be done on the hide. If it's just a hide that doesn't have face work, doesn't have paw work, doesn't have footwork, to be done, just roll it up, put the hide flesh to flesh, and then roll it up, you know, nice and tidy, and then freeze it, right? Now, if it's an animal where you do have paw work or face work to do, like this, this cape here with this Oryx, we've got a lot of face work we still gotta do before we, uh, we consult it. There, what you always wanna do is roll up your hide, and then the stuff that you have work to do on, like paws if it's a bear, you know, or a lion or something like that, or face if it's a cape, what you want to do is put that on the outside, okay? Because you can see here what happens is when you start to thaw out the animal, the first thing to thaw out is going to be on the outside of the animal. So you can see this oryx, this is all nice and thawed. It's really co it's cool to the touch, but it's thawed out. But what you can see is this is actually still rock hard, all right? So that's nice because you're going to see I can work on this face. I can work on turning the lips, turning the ears, cleaning up the eyes. I can work on that, and I've got plenty of time because this is still fine. The other cool thing I can do is I can take that as I work on it, take a break, and just lay it on that brick of hide that's cold, and that's going to keep this nice and cool for me. This whole process what we're trying to avoid is bacteria growth and buildup in these hides. So what we're trying to do is limit the time frame from when they thaw out to when they are salted, okay? And that salt is gonna stop all the bacteria growth in its tracks and make them so they're, you know, they're kind of just held for you know, an indefinite amount of time and non-perishable. But that gap, you wanna keep really small. So this is key that you have it set up that any work you have to do is on the outside as it thaws out. If this face was inside the middle of this hide, it might take double amount of time before I can start to work, but the other thing is, is by the time I start to work on this face, this body hide will have been thawed for hours and hours, if not you know more than a day. And so it's gonna be exposed to room temperature or cool temperatures where bacteria can still grow for a long period of time before we get the whole project salted. So be conscientious of that when you roll stuff up and you freeze it. Generally, if you got stuff to work on, it's like face and paws. Make sure those are on the outside so you can get to those first. And then once you're done with that, your main hide will be thawed out. You have a little work on it, clean it up, salt it, and boom, you're done. What do you need in terms of tools? Some of these utility blades. You can use a Havilon, you can just use a super, super sharp knife also, but utility blades I just find are handy. If you are gonna use a knife to do this hand fleshing, use something that's got a little belly in it, okay? You want a knife that has a little belly in it, that's gonna be a lot easier to use. If you use something like a Havilon, you can get away with it, but that shape, you know, of a scalpel blade, just a point, you're gonna be much more likely to pop the hide when you're using it, okay? If you've got a belly, it's a lot easier just to choke up on the knife and use that and, and get those pieces off. If you've got any holes that you wanna sew up before the hide is tanned, uh, you just need some wax thread and a needle. I'm not gonna go real deep into that. I'm not actually even sure you know, what the whole situation on this hide is. There may not be even anything for me to show you on, but if there are holes, what I recommend is just learn how to do a simple whip stitch or a baseball stitch, and it's not a big deal. I've found that you can do it before they get tanned or after, and I haven't had a problem either way. I'm sure there's taxidermists out there that have an opinion on that, but for me, no problem either way. Just learn how to do one of those simple stitches and you can sew up holes. And then you're gonna need salt, all right? And I'll show you the salt that I use. There's two salts you can use. You can essentially just use like Morton's containers. You wanna get the non-iodized version. You're basically gonna need like 15 of these to really do like a simple deer hide well. You're gonna need 15, maybe 20 of them uh, to do that. 
you know, for a cape or something like that, tan you're gonna have no problem with. They're basically a pound a piece, so that kind of gives you an idea. Just get some extra where you don't have to worry about uh, how much salt you're using. The other salt that I use is I'll just use feed salt, but it's hard to find nowadays. You used to be able to find it at feed stores, but if you get feed salt, you have to have pure fine grain mixing salt. You can't have the big blocky salt or the salt that has minerals and trace mineral added to it. It'll discolor the hide. And it just doesn't work itself in well. You've got to have pure fine mixing salt for feed okay and it comes in 50 pound bags i'll show you a version of that this right here mixing fine salt okay you can find it at feed stores you might have to even have it ordered but it's nice to have it because you can get it in bulk and then you really don't have to worry about conserving salt you've got plenty you can just drench it in it and rub it in um, and the other thing about it is it's way more economical. It's cheaper to do it this way. Now, if you didn't do a really good job of skinning the animal in the field, you are gonna have to flesh the animal. Or as I mentioned before, if it's a predator that's got a bunch of fat on it and grease, you're gonna have to flesh the animal. So you're gonna need a fleshy knife. This is a Necker fleshy knife. It's got a dull side and it's got a sharp side, okay? And I'll show you how that works. And you're gonna have to have some sort of fleshy board. This one's been around for a while, so it's got a, got a grease color to it. Those are things you don't really need if you're just cognizant when you skin the animal or you got a ton of time just to flesh by hand. But those are extras. I will show you how to do that, so I wanted to mention them. I like to have just a little borax, okay? You don't have to have it. You don't need to go out and buy 10 pounds of borax just for this. But a little borax is nice because you can get it on your fingers and it'll keep your fingers dry and you can grab a hold of things as you work on the hide. And you want to get it laid out right when it's thawed enough because you want to limit the amount of time that it's completely thawed out. Okay, so this hide is, is pretty typical. It's got meat on it in spots that are pretty typical. So that's some around the neck, in the, you know, in the armpit, legs. This is bloodshot stuff. You wanna be really meticulous there. You need to really get that cleaned up. There's some fat on the back here, on the butt, right around the tail here. And then here, I did this in the field, but you wanna split the tail all the way down for hides, okay? Don't pull on the, on the hide at the tail on these animals, or, you, or you'll pull the tail and you'll split the tail right middle of the tail and lose like the puffy part right on a white tail but all animals are like that if you pull them you risk tearing that tail hair off what's acceptable before before salting what's not so ideally you want your hide to look like this just white you know maybe just a thin kind of clear you know clear structure there just a little you know it's a, you know it's a little bitty tendon stuff little bitty sinewy crap that'll salt up but you really need it to be like an eighth inch or less thick. You know, that's kind of your max. So this fat's got to come off here, anywhere here where this, where this meat here is more than, you know, an eighth of an inch. I've got to take that off. All this has got to come off. These big chunks are obvious. All this fat, this stuff here, anything like that. So that's got to come off. And we want it all to look like this and this. So the best way to do that, is just get these things started. And I find that if I hold my fingers right on the other side of where I'm cutting, I'm much, like, much less likely to cut through the hide because I can feel the pressure on my fingers and I just naturally don't wanna, don't wanna cut into my fingers. So when I've got the hide loose like that, I find that I kinda just steadily put my fingers underneath there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut all this stuff off by hand, run through that. That's pretty self-explanatory. Just to show you the process I'm gonna leave a little bit of stuff on here just to show you the process if I wanted to do like a bulk, you know, bulk fleshing of the, uh, the animal, what it would look like. Okay, so you can just see how you can work through that. And this hide, no problem, a guy could, it would take you a couple hours, but you can clean it up with one of these razor blades. Okay, all right, so now I've got my, my serial killer stuff on now. I've got garbage bags here on the ground just to minimize cleanup. Throw on my Crocs again to minimize cleanup because any all oh, you're gonna have all that fat and all that crap's gonna end up on your on your lower legs and shoes. So, anyways, I'm gonna take my fleshing board. I like to put it like right here in my hip. 
Now, when I get the weight of the height on here, I'll be able to, I'll have something to push on. It's better if you can do this like in the corner of a wall, at the base of a wall where you, you don't have to deal with this moving around. The next step to understanding this process is knowing how one of these good fleshy knives work. So this front piece part here on the curve, that's actually going to be fairly sharp. And the idea there is that you can start your way into the fat or the muscle. You can cut into it with that. Then you can flip your knife once you have, you know, it started by cutting the meat off and then you can flesh it down like this. Like I said, I'm just going to put my hip into it right here and hold it. Once you get a line going, it's pretty easy and get after it with that dull side of your knife and not risk a big sticking a big hole in your hide. Doing this in a nice cool environment is nice. You know, usually in the fall, your garage or something's nice and cool. And that helps because this this is like feels like it's still in the fridge, so I know that I'm not running any risk of damage to it while I work on it. Spring bears, when you're out in the field, you're fleshing them during a warm day, that's when you feel a little more time pressure. So this is what a, a good fleshed hide is going to start to look like. All right, so now we've basically gotten through the hard part or tedious part. That fat, sinew, muscle, anything that's more than like an eighth inch, you know, thereabouts is off of this hide. So you can see that it's nice and clean. You know, you're gonna have different colorations in different spots. And that's just, you know, you know, here's around the bullet hole, you know, where some blood kind of pulled, it's gonna be red. That doesn't mean anything bad. All it's, it's more about the thickness of that material, right? So like right here, like this stuff, I might clean up a little bit with my knife, you know, as I salt it. But generally this thing looks pretty good. Like this stuff is all saltable. It's a little minimal, little chunks of fat. So I'll go through and cut that up. But all of this could have been accomplished with your knife. The reality is, you know, 95% of what I just fleshed off could have stayed on the animal if I was more meticulous when I skinned it. I actually didn't plan on, on uh, salting this hide, so I wasn't real meticulous, but it doesn't matter. I could have saved that work by just skinning it, and then I easily could have just finished up the rest of it by hand with a knife or whatever. So all you guys wanting to do this, don't overcomplicate it. If just take your time. It's all a time and effort thing. So I'm going to go ahead and just lay this out flat and I'll show you the salting process next. Okay, so how I always start my salting on a fresh hide that's been nice and flesh is I put a bunch of salt down the middle. It's a line like that. And then I'm all about an abundance of salt, but I also like the salt to be worked in. Okay, so I'm going to work it in to the side and that's where that's where you run into issues. You can run into an issue where an uh, armpit or something is rolled over like this. And because that, that skin is, is dry, it started to dry, this happens more in the field than anything, but it'll, it'll be kind of sticky and it won't naturally just pop off. So what you'll end up doing is you'll end up just salting around it like that. And you won't even notice that there's, there's flesh in there that wasn't salted. Well, what happens is, is bacterial growth will occur in there before it gets tanned. And then what will happen is, you can see as you pull it back, none of this has been salted. So you're actually gonna slip all this hide plus all the hide back here where the roots weren't salted. So as you salt these animals, you really need to push the hide out. And like I said, that's mostly relevant. You're mostly gonna run into issues when you're in the field and the hide, you know, the hide starts to partially dry out and it starts to stick pretty sturdy to itself. You gotta be careful. And these arms is where that's gonna happen too. So volume of salt matters and making sure you get it everywhere, but you also wanna just pr push it in, flatten everything out, make sure you're getting all those little, those little curves in the hide, really pushing that hide out to its ends. Because you can have a pile of salt on a hide, but if you miss a section because it's hiding from you, it doesn't really matter how much salt you're using, you're still going to have problems. Thin hide like this, it doesn't take very much salt, really. Guy ends up wasting more salt than he uses, but why not? Salt's cheap. Make sure you get the very end of the tail. You know, I like to take some salt just shove it in there with my hand. 
Make sure I get to the very end of that tail. Here's a perfect example. You can see where that was flipped over. You want to make sure that gets flattened out. All right, so if I'm at home doing this, typically what I'll do is I'll salt it like this and then I'll just leave it for a couple days and I'll let that moisture soak up off, off the hide into the salt and then I'll take the salt off and re-salt it. If I'm in the field, what I'll do at this point is I'll fold it over and I'll actually roll it, you know, just so I can kind of, you know, monitor it and keep it out of the way where it's not going to get dirty. And I'll let that, moist, that salt suck the moisture off and then the same thing, I'll unroll it clean that salt off and re-salt it really good. What we're going for, and I'll show you as these hides cure up in the salt, but you don't want it to be so crunchy that it cracks when you roll it uh, before you send it. You want it to be pliable, but pretty darn dry, right? So you want to be able to roll it up so you can still get it in a shipping box, um, but I'll show you guys that next. This hide's ready to go for the next step. It, it can uh, sit like this for a couple days and we'll get the moisture sucked up out of it and then we'll re-salt it again. A hide like this is pretty thin. It's only gonna take a couple days for it to be basically ready to ship. All right, so we're basically at 24-ish hours from when this Oryx hide and this Whitetail hide were salted. So just a couple things for you to notice. You can see liquid outside of the hide there. That's all sucking off with the salt. But when you see liquid outside of the hide, which is common on thicker hides like bear hides, bull elk capes, this oryx cape, they've got a lot, they've got real thick hides in the front shoulders, as you can see here. What happens is there's just a lot of moisture there that's gonna still drain out. So what you'll find when you've got a hide like this, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that the hair side is probably sitting in some moisture. So you want to limit that, right? So right at 24 hours, that's kind of the max for the next step I'm gonna show you. With this whitetail hide here, you can see it looks totally different than the Oryx hide and that's because it's way thinner. So honestly, you could probably get away with just dusting off that salt and re-salting that thin whitetail hide right where it is, no problem. But because we've got this thicker hide, I'm gonna show you a little bit more in depth second step. So first I'm gonna look at the hide and take an assessment of where it's still got moisture to lose and where it's doing pretty well. You can see with all the blood there that's been sucked into the salt up into the front and then the texture of the salt. So on this hide, it's dusty, right? That salt is no longer absorbing. All that moisture that's in this hide has absorbed as much salt as it's going to on this whitetail hide. That's why that salt is just dusty. Now on this hide, Back here, it's got a little sandy texture to it, but there's still quite a bit of moisture in there. This still needs to be salted. Even back here on the thinner parts of this Oryx hide, this still needs to have a bunch of moisture that's treated with the salt. And that's the trick, guys. When you think about this, a lot of people say it's the pH, you know, the salt changes the pH of the flesh, and that's why bacteria growth is hindered. Really what it comes down to is the bacteria that's gonna harm your hides, the bacteria that makes the hair slip, it lives on fresh water. It can't live on salt water. So when we introduce this salt, and we essentially dissolve as much salt as possible into the moisture that's into the hide, we make the habitat for the bacteria inhabitable for it and that's what we're going for when we still got kind of you know mushy salt like this some moisture on it like that it's not near ready okay and then even worse when you've got where it's just slimy like this okay that you've got to get rid of that salt and you've got to retreat it with new salt i'm going to wipe off all the salt here just for the sake of being clean wipe it off put it in a pile wipe it off there i'll take them out outside i'll shake them off get rid of all that that uh, first day salt and then i'll come back in here i'll fresh salt them i'll push the salt in really well particularly on the spots that are wet right now still and i see a lot of moisture i'll be aggressive there and then what i'm going to do with these hides for essentially day two day three is i'm going to sit them up on something so they drip some people roll them and then they'll sit them like in a bucket with a brick on the bottom, something where that roll is not gonna sit in its own moisture. 
What I like to do is just salt them real good and press the salt in, and then I'm just gonna hang them on a sawhorse or a ladder. You know, these little hides, the sawhorse is perfect. Just lay it over, it's not dragging on the ground, and it lets it just drip, get rid of that moisture. On a big hide like this, a full, you know, a, a big elk cape, you know, or a full body cape like this off an of elk or a mule deer, oryx in this case, you're gonna have to use a ladder. And I'll show you how I do that. I'm gonna lay the hide on that ladder just so it drips off. I know that it's time to do my final salting when there's no more dripping, right? So you can see where this was dripping on the floor here. It's all dried up now, and that's because it hasn't dripped recently. So we'll take this off, we'll knock off all the wet salt, I'll sweep it away, and then I'll lay these hides down for one last kind of light salting before I let them dry out for another three or four days and then wrap them up and send them in. It's amazing the difference. This hide here, basically, I would feel comfortable just sending this hide in right now. It's that much thinner and that much drier. All right, so we're successfully at the last part of this process. And the way to test to make sure your hides are ready for shipment is you want them to have like a little stiffness to them, okay? But you can still roll them, all right? And that's good. They're really the function there is you want them to be dry and you don't want there to be moisture that are gonna cause issues in slipping because potentially when you send these into, into the tannery, they may be just put on a shelf in storage for you know a few weeks, maybe to a month or even more. So you don't want there to be moisture in there that's gonna affect the hair or cause you problems, but you also want them to be pliable enough that you can roll them so you can get them into a box. So in this case, this is just perfect. Like this Oryx, you wanna have be able to just bend it, okay, where you, you can manipulate it, but you can see the hide, there's no moisture. You know, even this face that I'm, that I'm uh, leaving on this hide, you know, these are, these are thick areas and it's hard to get all the material off. So, you, you know, it might not be bone dry, but it's gonna be, it's gonna feel pretty close to that and have a little pliability. As long as all that salt is set in there, you're not gonna have a problem at all. There's no smell. It's just, all the, the salt that you do have on there is just coming off like powder. There's no standing moisture in it. You're ready to go. And you can see like this Oryx hide, it really started to cure up nice the last, you know, 12 hours. But this, this whitetail hide, I probably could have shipped it 24 hours to 36 hours ago. Um, but just because it is a thinner hide, it's gonna stay pliable for more, for a longer period of time, okay? You can see, again, no moisture on the back of it. So the way I send these into the tannery, and I think it's important that you kind of have a little system just so you mitigate any issues, is I just take a big, sturdy, sturdy box here, cardboard box. So go to the tannery's website that you're gonna use. In the description of this video, I'll give you all the details on the tannery that I utilize, and they're one of the biggest in the US. All I can say is very positive things about them, right? So all their information is in the description. They do a huge volume of hides and no problems, and this is exactly how I send my hides into them once they're salted. A good, sturdy cardboard box, I go on the tannery's website and I print out all the necessary forms. Follow the details. The majority of these tanneries tell you exactly what they need from you. Those forms are very important for those tanneries. So don't just throw them in here with the hides and have them floating around where they can slip out of the box or vanish in, in the packing material or whatever. What I do is I take those forms and I tape them on the inside of the box right here. So whenever the box is open, it's very obvious that they're there and they're taped and wh whoever's unpacking the forms gets them right then and they make sure and have them. Years ago, I actually had a lion that I sent in. I just used to throw the forms in and immediately the tannery called me because lions in particular, they're, they're a CITES animal. They need to have all the proper tagging paperwork and that wasn't in there. It, and I know I put it in the box, so it must have fell out somewhere during the journey, but that can be very serious. In that case, that tannery was very helpful and they called me and they were like, we need this form immediately, right? They could have just sent the hide back. They could have destroyed the hide. It would have been on me. So make sure you guys do that because that's very important to the tanneries. They have to follow a bunch of different regulatory uh, items and they want to make sure everything's legal. Just as a precaution, I shove dry material in the bottom of my box. You know, uh, 
crumpled up newspaper. In this case, I've got some crumpled up, you know, just paper bags, uh, grocery bags. And the idea there is if there is just some lingering moisture, like on the hair side, you know, somewhere on the animal that's gonna drip off, you might as well, this is kind of like your last drip phase. When you roll these up and then put them in here to send to the tannery, you know, if there happens to be something you missed, and most likely it's gonna be on the hair side of the animal, cause you've been salting this side, like you know if there's moisture or not, you know if it's ready, but you could not realize that there's some just, you know, residual moisture on the, on the hair, on the outside of the hide. The hope is that if you put some material in here that'll soak it up, when you put these hides in here, they're gonna drip that off and any you know slight risk that that's gonna cause you a problem, it's actually gonna come off the hides in the shipment, okay? It's just an extra safety precaution that I do. I'll just roll these hides up fairly loosely, not really tight, and then I put each hide in an inexpensive, you know, just cotton game bag. You can get these at Walmart. They're inexpensive. There's a couple nice things about doing that. One, it just contains everything into a bag for the people unpacking them, and it makes it much easier to move them around without getting salt all over the place. So I find it's just easier to put each individual hide into one of these uh, game bags. A small hide like this, you know, depending on how you're shipping it, you really don't even need to completely fold it over. You can get away with just a quarter fold. We're gonna take our bigger hide here, and I don't worry about getting rid of a bunch of the, you know, a bunch of the salt or anything on them. Um, you know, it's yeah, it's a little extra weight shipping wise, but it's not the end of the end of the world. So on this hide here, I'll fold it over completely like that. Get the tail in here, protect it. You want to roll the hide at this point. It's amazing how quickly they can cure. It's a day or 12 hours of difference, and they can be very hard to, to manage all of a sudden. Hey, That'll go in the box also. All right, so it's been about 90 days since I sent the hides into the tannery, and I just got them back, and every time I get one of these boxes from the tannery, I'm super pumped to see the finished product. And these little whitetail hides are way underrated. They're actually very easy to handle, as you can see in the video, but they always turn out just beautiful. There's just something about a cool whitetail hide. I mean, it's not, it's not like finished taxidermy. Go watch my interview with Rogan. We actually talk about taxidermy. I personally, I, this mount's gray to this elk, but I actually like kind of more raw taxidermy, so Euro mounts, just throw rugs like this. I think they're just cool. So for me, this is like super special. It's a cool way to have a memory and kind of have a functional item around your house. Like you can throw this over a chair, you can hang it up on the wall, anything you want to do, but look out, this thing's turned out awesome. Super soft, ooh, it's like a, Perfect, man. And they're super economical. I think I had this tan for less than a hundred bucks. All right, guys, so that's the whole process. Like I said, this is gonna save you a ton of money. You're gonna take a bunch of risk out of the equation and you're gonna get your hides way faster if you go through this process. Even the first one, if you take your time, you're not gonna have any problems and it's a great way to do it. Cool skill set to learn how to do. I think every hunter out there, every guide should know how to do it. If you want to keep in touch with me more directly and you want to know when any of my planned events like my hunting seminars, shooting schools, any of that stuff is coming up, please go to my website at pursuitwithcliff.com and sign up for the newsletter. Thanks guys.